And what we've been doing is, the past couple weeks, we've been talking about the problem of evil, um, especially out of the book of Job. And for the next several weeks, we're going to continue on in what's called the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. So tonight is Proverbs, next week Ecclesiastes, and then the week after that, Song of Solomon. And that's an entire book in the Bible about sex. So now you're listening. So next week is Ecclesiastes, then the week after, Song of Solomon. Should be really, really fun. Um, And the way that we like to look at these, well, let me pray, and then we'll talk about these. Okay, ready? Let's pray. God, thanks a ton for um, your love for us. Thank you that your mercy triumphs over judgment. Thank you, God, that more than anything, what you want to express to us is your love. So we pray tonight that you would open our ears to hear, Spirit, what you want to say. Amen. So the wisdom literature of the Old Testament is several different voices or characters, if you will, coming from different perspectives about the wisdom of God. So if you were to personify these different voices, according to the book, it would go something like this. The book of Proverbs, which we're gonna get into tonight, is this wise woman. She's observed thousands of people and sees the patterns, uh, the cause and effect of how life works. When people act a certain way, Lady Wisdom wants to tell you what the results will be. She wants to convince you that the wisdom of God is the apex, it's the ultimate that humanity can achieve. She wants you to know that this is an attribute of God that he's willing to share with you. And she says, forget everything and strive after this wisdom. That's Lady Wisdom. But then there's the uh, book of Ecclesiastes, and if this could be personified by a character, it would be a skeptical guy from Portland. He's like, you know, middle-aged, he's got his glasses on, he hangs out in the coffee shop at Powell's, he's read everything, he's done everything, he's been everywhere, he has a family, he's made a lot of money and lost it and made it again. And he's kind of like this, you know, uh, guy that... You know, he's an academic, he knows a lot, and if you were to sit down and talk with him in the coffee shop at Powell's, he would say, you know, yeah, wisdom's great, but life's complicated. It's not that simple. He would like to tell you that um, he offers a counterbalance, the other side of the coin of wisdom. Yeah, sure, wisdom's important, but he would say there's actually more to life. That's Ecclesiastes. And then finally, there's Job, or job, depending on how you pronounce that one. And he's an older man. He had a family and wealth, and he lost all of his children, and then later regained them in life. And he is this guy that actually led a wise, upright, righteous life, yet tragically lost it all. And Job raises that question that we've all asked, Why do bad things happen to some of the best people? How do you make sense out of that in God's world? Job addresses that question. So each of these different voices in each of these different books are wisdom from God, but they come in different forms and in different perspectives. And it's almost like you need to sit down in the coffee shop with all three of them and hear each of them out and then respond accordingly. So that's a kind of a a framing for the wisdom literature, and tonight we're going to just look at Proverbs. So if you would, turn with me in your Bibles or on your iPhone to Proverbs chapter 1. And what we're going to do is just an overview of kind of how to approach the book of Proverbs and why it's super, super important. I think you're going to like it. I have no idea what you're thinking, but I'm thinking you're going to like it. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1. And by the way, uh, a little bit more before we read this, I can hear you still flipping. So you go to Psalms, big book, and then you go one more to the right from there. You'll find it. Uh, If not, just look at your neighbor. So the book of Proverbs is broken up structurally um, simply. The first uh, nine chapters of the book are these speeches. And then the 10th chapter through the 31st are these kind of couplet, for the most part, Proverbs um, in earnest. So kind of these wise sayings, these uh, reflections 
on life and the way it is. But the first section of chapter one that we're gonna read right now, it just kind of gives you the Reader's Digest super small snapshot, what is this whole thing about, who wrote it, that kind of deal. So let's read it, it's really helpful. Ready now? Okay, Proverbs chapter one, verse one. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables and the sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord, and notice if it's Lord, all caps, L-O-R-D, that's Yahweh, God's personal name. So the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So written by Solomon, Um, some of the Proverbs are from other people, but the majority of the book um, is this compilation of Solomon's wisdom. And quite simply, um, the book exists to gain wisdom, knowledge, insight. And before we go too far, we kind of have to define what is wisdom. And what's interesting is the Hebrew idea behind it is so much bigger than just what we would think of as wisdom. And the Hebrew word is chokhmah. Can you say it one more time? Chokh with a <laughs> clear the throat there. Chokhmah. Ready? We're going to say it together. One, two, three. Chokhmah. Yeah, you got it. Whoa, that was a bit much right there. Someone was clearing their throat the whole time. (laughs) Chokhmah is this universal law woven into the fabric of the universe. It's actually described that when God created everything that exists, He did it through chokhmah. All of creation is ordered and coheres to chokhmah. It's a set of cause and effects in the universe that you can choose to work with or against. It's kind of like um, if you've ever worked with wood, I'm not like a super wood guy, but you know, if if you've worked with wood before, you know that there's a grain. And if you cut along the grain and like you're gonna sand and finish the wood along the grain, it works well. But if you go across the grain and try and sand across the grain, it's difficult, it creates issues. And that is this idea of chokhmah. It's a universal flow in the universe. And I know what you're thinking, it sounds a lot like the force in Star Wars, right? And John Mark's not here, but we do have a picture of John Mark with his Star Wars family. (laughs) And if you haven't been to Bridgetown, welcome to Bridgetown, we're a Star Wars church. And uh, Joe Mark's on vacation, but in his heart right now, he's just feeling like, oh man, I think they're going to be okay at Bridgetown tonight. So Lady Wisdom looks at these patterns in relationships, family, sexuality, business, and she invites you into this flow of chokmah, of wisdom. She's basically saying, look, all of the universe works well when you're in step with wisdom. That's her argument. Now, if you read much of this book, you'll see right away that there's um, this literary structure where basically it's a father writing to his son. So look at chapter one, verse eight, it says, listen, my son, to your father's instruction. Or verse 10, my son. And then chapter two, verse one, my son. And it goes on and on and on. The structure is this father speaking to the son. So the question is, okay, why? Why is it so important that uh, this dad needs to impart all this wisdom to his son? And the, the answer is pretty obvious. It's because young men can be really dumb. And I can say that because I was a young man, and it's true. I mean, think about it. The age for men 18 to 25 year olds, that's the highest death rate, the mortality rate for men is during that time. Some of you guys are almost through. You can make it. You're going to make it through. Um, And then after 25, it drops off because even biologically, the frontal cortex of the brain, which helps us make decisions, isn't even fully formed in men until after 25. So I'm just saying, as one dude to some other dudes, 
we definitely need this wisdom. It's a certain kind of medicine that we need. And ladies, don't feel left out because as the story goes on and wisdom is personified, it's personified by Lady Wisdom. And she not only represents Yahweh, the Creator God's wisdom, she represents Him, Himself. So, as we continue on, a couple things I just want to point out about Proverbs as you're reading. The first thing is this. There's a difference between information and wisdom. Wisdom is not information. So, think about this. A few hundred years ago in our country, a person If they took everything they learned in their entire lifetime, all the information of a lifetime, it could fit in a newspaper, like a copy, a daily copy of the New York Times. That was it in their entire lifetime. But today, in our current culture, we're in a state of information overload. Every day we wake up to news alerts on our phone, we open our web browser to unending amounts of information. I mean, you can watch now a movie at home, and if you're watching and you're like, hey, where's the setting? Like, um, where did they film this? Where's the location they're filming? This is really cool in this movie. You can pull out your phone and like type in like, you know, whatever movie you're watching and locations, and then boom, it's right there. Like, oh, who's that actor? I don't know who that is. Type in their name, boom. All of, there's information to an absurd level. Have you guys watched any uh, movies on Amazon Prime? There's this bar on the side that if you hover, if you're watching on your laptop and you're watching a movie on Prime, there's this bar on the side you hover your mouse, your uh, cursor over, and there's basically a little profile of the actor that's on that any given scene. There's location stuff. There's trivia information for older movies that are noteworthy. I mean, it's almost distracting. You could like read this whole sidebar and miss the entire movie. There's information upon information. And If you think about it, in our city, like, who doesn't want to know about the latest thing? Our city has something new that you can know about every day. A new restaurant, a new development, a new donut. It's it's just constant, right? And even in our city, there's like this shame if you don't know about the latest thing. People are like, hey, have you uh, been to Pine Street Market? I'm like, no, I haven't eaten. They're like, oh, man, I thought you would have by now. You're like shamed publicly for not knowing new information. That's the air that we breathe, right? But here's the thing. Wisdom is different than information because it's not new. It's timeless. Unlike info that needs to be updated, wisdom and Proverbs has withstood millennia. Millions of people literally have, from thousands of different cultures, from tons of different contexts, have tried out the wisdom of God in Proverbs and proven that it's good. And wisdom is different from information because wisdom has to be lived out. It's not just like some trivial factoid that's useful at a party or in a game to know some detail about some random thing. Listen, information is like valuable for a moment, and then it's useless. It's like a boarding pass if you've flown on a plane ever in your life. If you haven't, you totally should. But if you've flown recently, you're given this boarding pass with like the gate and your seat assignment and your name on it, and it's like really important, right? You get through security, you're like, I got my boarding pass. And then like you're on your way to your gate and you have to go to the bathroom, and you're like, okay, I will put the boarding pass in this pocket. And then you do your thing, and then you come back out, and you're like, where's the boarding pass? You know, you got to have your boarding pass. You go through, and they, get, they scan it through the gate, and you're like, oh, please, God, like, don't make it pop up and say that I'm, like, on the terror watch list or something. And it, like, scans, and it was like, yes, I made it. You look at your boarding pass for your seat. You get to your seat, and then all of a sudden, the boarding pass is useless. It becomes a bookmark after that point, or it's just like you leave it. It just doesn't matter. But for a moment... It's so, this is the most important thing in the world. And that's what information is like. Factoids, sound bites, trivia are valuable for a second. And then they're discarded and thrown away. But wisdom, unlike information, reminds us that the decisions that we make actually have consequences. Wisdom teaches us that even the super informed in our day and age can still be foolish. You can know everything about culture 
You can know everything about your profession, real estate, finance, and still be totally out of step with the flow of God's wisdom and be a fool. I mean, like a woman who has advanced successfully in her career and climbed the corporate ladder and more responsibility, more notoriety, bigger paycheck, she can seem so smart in that realm and yet have a marriage at home that's falling apart. I mean, think about it. We all know people who are super well-informed, successful, and yet their personal lives are a wreck. Because too often, we mistake information and intelligence for wisdom. They are not the same. Wisdom is skilled living, and we need it. I need it to know how to navigate the ins and outs of daily lives, relationship, marriage, family, business, sexuality, everything. We desperately need wisdom. And one of the things that's super helpful about wisdom is that it's practical. It's down to earth, okay? And, and a simple way to think about wisdom is this. It's knowing how to say and do the right thing at the right time. Wisdom has to do with what sociologists call emotional intelligence or EQ. You've heard of IQ, right? Intellectual and in, like intelligence, right? EQ is emotional intelligence. This is what we call social skills or street smarts. It's the skill of handling interpersonal relationships, knowing how to say and do the right thing at the right time. And the other day, you know, I was uh, downtown, Northwest 23rd, with my son and my wife, and we're walking up by, you know, uh, Levi's and Urban. We're going up to like Cost Plus World Market. And this guy who we don't know, who's a little bit like just different and super friendly in a weird way, uh, comes right up next to us and he's like, he's got like this blazer, like a sports jacket on. And I don't know if he had anything underneath. It might've just been that. And he's like, he walks right up to us and he's like, hey, I got the sport jacket or something like that. I'm like, hey dude, I don't know if I know you. And my son, Simon, like doesn't skip a beat. You know, Simon's 16, he doesn't skip a beat. And he's like, hey man, that thing's cool. And the guy's like, yeah, I need to get some leather elbow patches on it. And Simon's like, yeah, and like maybe some glasses. And the guy's like, yeah, man, totally, you know? And they just like chatted up a little bit. And then the guy opened the door and we went into World Market and thankfully he didn't follow us. But the thing is, is that Simon expressed in that moment, like sometimes somebody like that comes up to you on the street and you're like, hey, dude, this is weird. I'm going to run, you know, or you just like ignore them. But Simon just jumped right in. He's like, oh, yeah, hey, man, that jacket is cool, you know, or whatever. And, and some people just have that naturally. That's that idea of EQ. And some would say that this emotional intelligence is even a greater indicator of success than IQ. Some have said that oftentimes the A students end up working for and working under the C students. But you can't have both. So if you're like, perfect, I'm going for all Cs. No, you can't have both. But Proverbs guides you in this ability of knowing how to say and do the right thing at the right time. So I just want to show you a couple of these super practical. These are like how to be a better human Proverbs. Okay, you ready for this? One person. Okay, the rest of you guys just listen in. Proverbs 27, 14, we'll put it up on the screen. If anyone loudly blesses their neighbor early in the morning, it will be taken as a curse, <laughs> right? And most of you guys are like, duh. But you know, um, I think I've shared with you before, I like to get up uh, early, make coffee, and then I'm usually the first one down in the kitchen. And as my kids are like waking up and coming down, and my wife's coming down, I'm like so excited to see everybody. I'm an extrovert, I've been alone for like 10 minutes. So I'm like, where is everybody? And certain members of my family who will go unnamed, when they come down, I'm like, hey, it's so good to see you. Oh my gosh, how'd you sleep? Are you ready for breakfast? You know, what's going on? And I get like a, Ugh. you know, like their greeting back to me is a grunt. And I actually had talked to him before and I repented of this, but I would be like, hey, you know, you should be more friendly. Like, you know, what's that? You know, that's, I thought they were in the wrong, but actually I'm in the wrong. It's according to Proverbs, like <laughs> you don't expect that kind of greeting early in the morning. So, if you want to win friends and influence people to be well-liked, do not greet loudly early in the morning. Next one, Proverbs 24, 2. Let someone else praise you and not your own mouth. An outsider and not your own mouth. Well, what does this mean? Basically, let's be real and agree that nobody likes someone who brags. 
or constantly talks about themselves. The call of wisdom is to develop the skill of actually loving the other person by asking them questions and drawing them out. And not too long ago, uh, Jenny and I, my wife and I had this interesting experience with this. Uh, We were at a wedding and we're one of those people, I don't know if this has happened to you, but we always end up with the worst seats at like the, the meal at the wedding. You know how it works? It's like everybody's talking, milling around, doing whatever you do. You know, you're talking to people. I don't know, you're at a wedding, you just talk to people. You're talking, I talk a lot. And then they're like, hey, um, go ahead and grab your seats. And unless you're like the bride and the groom, it's kind of a free-for-all usually. They're like grab your seats and all the peasants are like trying to get a seat, you know? I'm one of them, but, but I have horrible luck and Jenny's like, what is wrong with us? I'm like, I don't know. But I always, we always end up where like all the seats are gone. Like we were going to the cool table and it was like taken. You're like, what? And then you look around, you're like, oh my gosh, there's not even any seats. Like we get like a card table in the parking lot and they're like, yeah, we'll bring some food out if there's any left, you know? <laughs> I've been to a wedding where I had to sit on the grass and everyone else was in seats at tables, okay? <laughs> And I've been to weddings actually with a lot of you guys. And some of you guys think it's like musical chairs. You're like hovering around the chair and then they're like, hey, get a seat. You're like, boom, right there. (laughs) I know your game. (laughs) So we're at this wedding and we're sitting next to this, you know, the last table. We're sitting next to this lady that we have no idea. All of our friends are somewhere else and we're with this lady. We don't know who she is. And so um, Jenny and I are just like, hey, so, you know, tell us about yourself. And so we'd ask a question and she would talk for like 30 minutes and they're like wow you know they're like okay well what about you have any family and then another 30 minutes and she uh basically we just asked her questions brief ones and then she talked a lot and by the end of the dinner she said this she said you know what i really liked getting to know you guys (laughs) ironically i don't know if that really happened and then she said the best thing ever she said and this has been one of the most interesting conversations i've ever had (laughs) i was like well it was easy you just talked the whole time But here's the thing, Proverbs teaches us how to interact with people in a way that's winsome, in a way that um, people walk away feeling encouraged, feeling honored. (laughs) If she's here tonight, she's probably not feeling honored. I'm still a work in progress, sorry about that. Um, But these are just basically the practicality of Proverbs. I'm really sorry if you're here. (laughs) I'd love to hear more about how you're doing after. (laughs) but not too much. (laughs) Kidding. She's totally not here. If she is, I'm going home after this. (laughs) Out the back. But Proverbs are just helpful in how to be liked by others and how to, in general, not be annoying. This is the grain of life, the way that life works best in God's world. But The wisdom in Proverbs is not just about life hacking. It also deals with morality and what's right and what's wrong. And this brings us to this concept of the fear of the Lord, the fear of Yahweh. If you remember at the very beginning, Proverbs uh, 1.7, look back there really quickly. It says, the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom. So the idea behind this is, is basically that the first step to getting into the flow of chokhmah, the flow of wisdom, comes with this concept of fear of the Lord. So what does it mean? The fear of the Lord does not mean that you run away from God in terror. It actually means that you respond to Him in humility. Listen, if there's anything we should be afraid of, it's life without God. It's life being alone on your own. But if you are a follower of Jesus, the good news, and if you want this life, the good news is he invites you into the very life of God. He wants to be with you, and he is safe and trustworthy. You know, um, a couple years ago, we began this journey of learning more about the Holy Spirit and listening prayer, and that God actually speaks to us today. And I was, and I've shared this before, but I was really afraid to slow down and have that silence to really listen to what God wanted to say to me. I mean, I thought that if I did that, if I was quiet and I heard God's voice, he would just remind me of all the ways I've screwed up. And I don't know about you, but like my mistakes and my shortcomings are in front of me already and I'm like, great. Now I'm just gonna take this time, I'm gonna ask God to speak and he's just gonna point out all the things I've done wrong. 
but what happened when I finally got to that place of still and quiet and said, oh, Spirit, speak, what do you want to say to me? It was the exact opposite. Just like the words of that song, God's mercy triumphs over his judgment. He delights in showing mercy. All of the judgment that I deserve has already been taken care of on the cross with Jesus. When I like slow down and when you slow down and you listen to God's voice, what he wants to speak over you is love. And now I have probably the best experiences I have had in the past two years have been these moments when God just overwhelms me with his love and his joy. And for me, oftentimes it comes with this emotion of like laughter and tears. And that's what hearing from God and the heart of God is like. And wisdom begins with this acknowledgement that God is the center of the universe, not us. He is a good king, but I'm not the king. So let's flesh this out a little bit more, this concept of the fear of the Lord, all right? Proverbs 3, 5 says this, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. The fear of God means I'm saying, God, you're the one that I'm gonna trust for good and evil. I'm not gonna lean on my understanding and how I define it. Instead, I look to you as my good king. Wisdom comes from outside yourself. It's from God imparted to you. You see, my understanding of life and situations and even ethics isn't always right. I don't know it all. I need God to guide me and to show me how to walk in this wisdom. And, and by the way, the end of that verse right there, the second part is trust the Lord with all your heart, lean on your understanding, acknowledge him in all your ways and he will make your paths Okay, a couple of you guys went to Sunday school. Straight. Here's the thing I want to say about that really quickly. Remember that this is the book of Proverbs, not the book of promises. The way this works out is you get in the flow of chokhmah. You live according to wisdom. And the likelihood, the, the majority of the time, things do work out according to that. But the reality is, we have a, we're in a battle of the world, the flesh and the devil that's fighting against us. And sometimes, case in point, Job, you'd be living the right way, you'd be honoring God, living in the flow of wisdom, and tragedy still comes. And God is there, and that's very much what we heard from Job. Next one, Proverbs 3, 7. Do not be wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord and shun evil. So just like Adam and Eve, we must choose. Do we wanna have this so-called wisdom from our own perspective, our own eyes, or are we able to say, no God, I fear you, I honor you, and you can tell me, you can guide me. I want you to give me your wisdom, not my own. And this, you can see practically, like in the workplace, I mean, picture somebody that just came out of college and they're in their first professional career and they're in a culture in the workplace where they're asked to lie, to falsify numbers, and everybody there in the, on their team and their company does it. It helps the company. Um, everybody's like, hey man, you're guaranteed not to get in trouble. This helps the company, this helps us. This is just what we do here. How does the fear of God and wisdom interact with that? Well, but wisdom says, quit the job and run. And you're like, well, this is my first job. I need this to like build up. No. Wisdom says you quit the job and you run. And, you, and it's like, well, then what about a paycheck? And wisdom says that in the long run, justice will be served. And all of those who are corrupt will be found out. The things that people do, have done in secret will be exposed and those who fear God and do justly will be rewarded. Fearing God leads to acting wisely and trusting that in the end, he's gonna take care of you. One more thing about Proverbs. At the end of this um, opening speeches, turn with me now to chapter seven. At the end of these speeches are two final invitations. 
As I said before, uh, chapters one through nine are the intro to the book, all of these speeches, and they leave you at the end of chapter nine with a choice. So let's begin um, in chapter seven, and we're going to read the first the speech, speech and invitation, and then we'll read the second one. You guys with me? Uh, Proverbs chapter 7, verse 6. A little story with an invitation in there. You ready? At the window of my house, this is the father speaking. At the window of my house, I looked down through the lattice, and I saw among the simple, I noticed among the young men, a youth who had no sense. He was going down to the street near her corner, walking along in the direction of her house, at twilight, as the day was fading in the dark of night, as it set in. Then out came a woman to meet him, dressed like a prostitute and with crafty intent. She's unruly and defiant. Her feet never stay at home. Now in the streets, now in the squares, at every corner. It's kind of creepy. It's like she's everywhere. Uh, she lurks. She took a hold of him and kissed him. And with a brazen face, she said, today I fulfill my vows and I have food from my fellowship offering at home. So I came out to meet you. I've looked for you and have found you. I've covered my bed with colored linens from Egypt, which I guess are nice. I don't know, I haven't seen them. Apparently, they're like really cool. Verse 17. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let's drink deeply of love till morning. Let's enjoy ourselves with love. My husband is not at home. He's been gone on a long journey. He took us his purse, think like man purse, like satchel. He took his satchel filled with money and will not come home until a full moon. With persuasive words, she led him astray. She seduced him with her smooth talk and all at once he followed her like an ox going to slaughter, like a deer stepping into a noose till an arrow pierces his liver. Ouch. Like a bird darting into a snare, little knowing it will cost him his life. Now, my sons, listen to me. Pay attention to what I say. Do not let your heart turn to her ways or stray to her paths. Many are the victims she has brought down. Her slain are a mighty throng. That means there's a lot that she's killed. Her house is a highway to the grave leading down into the chambers of death. So what's embedded in that little narrative is a speech, right? This seductress woman comes out and she's basically trying to lure this young man in to her house and ultimately to her bed. And that is a representative of folly and foolishness. And it's an invitation from her to anyone who reads this to follow her way. But now, conversely, let's go ahead and flip to um, Proverbs chapter 9, and let's hear another invitation. Proverbs chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. You ready? Wisdom has built her house. She has set up its seven pillars. She has prepared her meat and mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her servants, and she calls from the highest point in the city, let all who are simple come to my house. To those who have no sense, she says, come, eat my food, drink the wine I have mixed, leave your simple ways, and you will live. Walk in the way of insight. Now skip down to verse 13. Now she's speaking about folly. She says, folly is an unruly woman. She's simple and she knows nothing. She sits at the door of her house and on the seat at the highest point of the city, calling out to those who pass by, who go straight on their way, let all who are simple come to my house. To those who have no sense, she says, stolen water is sweet. Food eaten secret is delicious. But little do they know that the dead are there that her guests are deep in the realm of the dead, period. So here's the contrast. Two invitations to two different meals and two different women. One, the seductress. Her husband's gone. She's got some food. She's got her bed made out, and her lips are dripping like honey in her seductive speech. And then on the other hand, you have Lady Wisdom. Her house is at the highest point in the city, and in the ancient Near East, this is where the temple would be. And the temple is where God meets with man, and I think what's happening here is that Lady Wisdom is shown in the place where God's temple would be, and she's representing the creator God, Yahweh. 
and she's inviting anyone that will listen to eat with her. And the greatest difference is, Lady Wisdom says, eat with me and you will live. And Lady Folly says, eat with me and it will be really good. It's kind of like the stripper at the club or the dealer offering a high. It's going to be really good and it's going to end in death. She says, come with me for a really good time. But then what Proverbs says is, but what you don't know is that all who eat with her are dead. It's like everybody who went in and joined her for a meal ended up dead and buried under the house. That's the contrast. Choose today, which will it be, life or death? And the key is, who do you trust? Who are you loyal to? The invitation tonight is that there is a force in the universe of wisdom that God himself is part of. And he invites you in. Lady Wisdom invites you to join and says, this is the way life works best. Follow me into it. But we have to ask the question, what if you're here tonight and you have not tapped into the life-giving force of wisdom? You've been listening to the wrong voice and you went to dinner at the wrong woman's house, so to speak. I mean, what if you're here right now and relationally, sexually, financially, you've made unwise choices. You've been outside of God's best for your life. What do you do then? And the answer is clear. You run to Jesus tonight. If you've been living outside of wisdom, come back in tonight. You just simply have to admit that with all your intelligence, there are still things that you got wrong. Give up your autonomy. Let Jesus be your king. Let him comfort you tonight. You know, as we were praying before the gatherings, um, one of our, uh, just a guy from the church said, hey man, I just have this really strong sense that tonight God wants to say to some people to taste hope. And he's like, but it's not just taste hope. It's actually be overwhelmed with hope. And if you are in a situation right now in your life and you feel like, man, I do not see a way out. I do not see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, This is bad. I think tonight God wants to offer you hope. And that hope comes in the form of Jesus. You see, Jesus is the embodiment of God's wisdom. Um, Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. He said, it's because of God that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. You, you guys, if you want to know wisdom, it's Jesus. Jesus, the way he lived, the way he spoke, the way he related to God the Father and to others, That was a perfect life of wisdom. One scholar said it this way, the message is clear, Jesus is wisdom herself. Tonight, turn to Jesus. And for some of you, maybe you need wisdom about um, a decision you have to make or direction in your life. And the answer for you is to come to Jesus. God actually loves it when we call out to him for wisdom. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, ask God who gives it freely and abundantly. That's a prayer that God loves. God, give me wisdom. I don't know what to do. Show me. He loves to show you. He rewards those who seek after him. He is good. He wants to overwhelm you with his love. And this wisdom can be found in Jesus by his spirit here tonight. Let's pray. If you go ahead and just clear off your, your lap, we're gonna have a couple moments of silence and let's just invite the Spirit. Holy Spirit, we just ask you to come to speak to us right now, God. What do you wanna to say to us? We're listening. Holy Spirit, come.